All right, so everybody that's here, uh, here we are in Leviticus chapter 25. Chapter 25 is all about the Jubilee. Number one in our notes. Can everybody see the notes, by the way? Yeah. If you can see the notes, okay, good. I want to make sure everybody can see it. Uh, Jubilee is a one-year time period that happens every 50 years. Now, it is true that the Jubilee has been lost as far as when God initiated it, um, nobody really knows if we're on the same 50-year pattern that God initiated from the beginning. Because factually, Israel did not really keep the Jubilees very faithfully. Um, when they first started out, I suppose they probably did. But there's no indication uh, in the biblical text, anyway, that Israel ever really kept the Jubilee. Now, there are lots of things that are written in the Talmud about the Jubilee, uh, but basically not about actually keeping it, but defining in what area it actually applies, how far from Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we have to realize the reason for that is the Jubilee is all about restoration of property uh, and freedom from debt. Um, those are all good things from people that have lost their property uh, and are in debt that if nothing else, you can wait 50 years and everything will be returned to you and all of your debt will be released. The problem is, is that whoever you're indebted to, uh, how is it that you're going to be able to pay them back? And so God set up the whole system, if you will, saying, okay, I've given each one of the tribes a certain allotment of land, and everybody in the tribe can divide the land up, and they can take land and live on the land, and it belongs to them. Uh, and if you get indebted, then you can sublease your, your land to somebody else for a period of time. And they can harvest the crops. And the price of the crops that they derive from the harvest then can go towards paying off your debt. Uh, or you can uh, put yourself into servitude and work for the person you're indebted to until your debt is paid off. Or uh, every 50 years, uh, then it will be forgiven you that God will make that provision of reverting everything back to its original owner. Now, what we've just discovered recently and the reason that uh, we even identify the past four quote unquote jubilees we've had is because we've seen the return of the nation, the land of Israel to the people of God's choosing to the Jewish people. And so we've watched and every 50 years in a series of four times so far, we're in the fifth uh, jubilee. Uh, we've watched a series of events that has recognized that Jerusalem belonged to Israel, that the land was given back to the Jewish people, uh, that the land that was withheld from them was won by them in a, in a miraculous war, and we've just recently experienced Jerusalem being recognized throughout the world as the capital of Israel. So we've had a series of restoration of property that belonged to the Jewish people that God gave to them. Uh, by the way, when I use the word gave, we're going to look at that in a little while. Gave is more like leased, not gave outright. And um, so God allowed Israel to have the land. He says he retains it as his. It's his land, but he lets them lease it and utilize it. 
if they behave themselves and follow his regulations and stipulations, then of course they can stay in the land and there's blessings. Uh, if they disobey, then there's problems. And so uh, while the people were there, if they uh, did what God said, there was great blessing. Uh, if somebody for one reason or another ended up being in debt, that he could, within his own tribe primarily, there were some regulations as to who uh, you could give the land to for 50 years or whatever time was left before the next jubilee, uh, you could sublease it to those people with the understanding that they could use the land, but they had to follow God's regulations, and they would then derive the benefit of being able to sell the crop that would be produced in the land. We got to remember that Israel was basically an, uh, an agricultural society. Uh, they weren't necessarily merchants so much as they were agriculturally based. Now, they did become merchants, and God addresses the issue of the differences between the land in a walled city, the land in a village which wasn't walled, and farmland. And God made all kinds of uh, stipulations that governed all of that. But A in our notes, the focal points of the Jubilee are restoration and mercy. God wanted to restore to Israel uh, what they had lost through their own failings, if you will, or because of things that happened outside of their control. And he wanted to show them mercy. So number one, we have a divine demonstration of Yahweh's grace. And it was to be paralleled, if you will, uh, with like physical acts by his people. Uh, as much as God wanted to be merciful and gracious to his people, God expects his people to likewise be merciful and gracious to their follow, fellow uh, brothers and sisters in the faith. Um, it was just a reciprocity perspective that if you've been given grace, you should show grace. You've been given blessing, you should be a blessing. And so on and so forth. We find that, of course, in the Breed How to Shaw. We, you know, there's many scriptures that tell us the same thing. Well, this is a very physical demonstration of that reality. And, and we have to realize that that's what God was doing in Leviticus primarily. I mean, all the sacrifices, everything was physical. And it was to teach a spiritual uh, truth and establish a spiritual foundation. And, of course, it took a long time for people to learn. But uh, here we are today, and, you know, we're worshiping Yeshua. Uh, we don't have a physical temple. We're not doing all those physical things. But we are doing all of those things that spiritually we're supposed to be doing. Um, Unfortunately, uh, not everybody uh, is ready for that spiritual level that God requires from us. And so we have, of course, people at all different levels of understanding of what goes on in the spiritual realm. Hopefully we can, uh, through our studies of Leviticus and other uh, portions of the scripture, uh, we can begin to get a better understanding of what God really wants from us. Yes, he did want the physical uh, observations and those things to be carried out precisely the way he wanted. And now with Yeshua, we have to realize he's still very much peculiar in regards to wanting things to be done his way. So. Um, if he says we are to be perfect as he is perfect, then, then that's what we should be. And of course, all of us are quick to say, well, uh, I'm far from perfect, but you know, I'll do my best. Well, <laughs> because we have been given the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, um, realistically, uh, when we really push the envelope, we are to be perfect and he expects us to be perfect. So. 
uh, you and I and everybody else, um, we can say what we want, but the standard is still God's standard. Uh, and so I would suggest that we quit um, looking for the excuse and start doing the things that put us in the right place before the Lord. So, all right. So, um, A in our notes, the restoration of property and the release from servitude caused by debt. This is what the Jubilee primarily dealt with. Uh, number one in our notes, all debt in the Hebrew system was secured debt. Uh, we, we have unsecured debt today. It's called credit card debt. Um, credit card debt is based on uh, faith in your ability to pay. And, of course, they will pursue you in many ways if you don't pay. But it's still unsecured debt. Uh, with Israel, it was always uh, a system of secured debt, either by land or uh, personal servitude. In other words, you would then be put in a position of going to work for the person that you owed the money to. And it wasn't you just worked whenever you got a chance for them. Uh, you were exclusively put into service night, day, 24 hours a day, six days a week with a little rest on Shabbat. But you were uh, to be an employee uh, of the person you were indebted to. You were not a slave, but you were indentured. Um, in other words, your time was not your own. So number two in our notes here, the ownership of the land that Yahweh gave Israel, the Hebrew word for give, is actually the word Nathan. And Nathan means set apart for you or leased. It was land that was leased to Israel, not given to them outright. And our nose to understand the term lease, it's the use of property for a set time. It's not ownership. Um, Israel was given the land for a set time, forever. That's a set time. God said it. Um, they did not and do not have ownership of the land, uh, which means that God has retained that position. And... Because, one in our notes here, Yahweh retained ownership, the property was never to be sold outright to anybody else. You can't sell something legally that doesn't belong to you. Um, you know, if, uh, like today, most people have a mortgage. Well, you can sell the property, but you do have to pay off the mortgage uh, as part of the sale. Well, with God, uh, he does not want money in exchange for the land. He says the land is his already. What he wants is you to use it and to use it the way that he has uh, established it. So some of the stipulations, A, in our notes, uh, you could sublease to a kinsman with unlimited right to redeem. In other words, uh, you always had the right to redeem the property. If either somebody else paid the debt that you owed or uh, you were able to earn uh, money or do something that would a enable you to pay off your debt, then you could redeem the property at any time. Uh, if you didn't ever come up with the sufficient funds, then the property would be returned to you uh, at the Jubilee. And that's why some people really love the idea of Jubilee, and some people absolutely loathe it. Uh, they don't like it because they're making money, and as long as they have the property, they have extra income. Um, and if you never get to, quote unquote, get enough money to pay it off, 
then even though you might have owned, let's say, a thousand dollars, and there's you got it in the fortieth year of the jubilee, meaning there's ten years left, and so if you kept it for ten years and the crops were worth a hundred dollars, well then you would break even. But if the crops were worth two hundred and fifty dollars, and the guy was never able to come up with the money to pay you off then you got 10 years of crops uh, at $250. Uh, well, that's $2,500, let's say, and you ended up with uh, $1,500 above what you had been owed originally. Well, that's very profitable. And so uh, those that had lent money out really didn't like the idea of the Jubilee at all. Now, we're going to find with Yeshua, by the time that he's walking on planet Earth, uh, the Jubilee is not practiced in any way, shape, or form. Um, <laughs> it just wasn't being done because uh, people were more interested in being financially secure and making money as opposed to quote unquote, being that concerned about their fellow kinsmen. And so we'll find that, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, uh, another one of the stipulations, number two in our notes, the land must rest every seventh year. The land required a Sabbath. Uh, and if you did not give the land a rest, uh, you'd be exiled from the land. Reading in verses 2 through 4, uh, we read here, it says, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I shall give to you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord, you shall not sow your field, nor prune your vineyard. Now, uh, the major thing about this is, is that uh, pruning, if you're growing uh, grapes, for example, pruning is vital uh, in order to get a good crop of grapes. So every time you don't prune, you diminish the ability of the grapevine to produce good grapes. However, what God is doing here, he's saying, listen, if you will obey me, I will override the natural law and I will bless you abundantly. Your land will produce more than it will from the natural standpoint. If you do not, well, then you'll get by the best way you can. Um, today in Israel, uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of farmers will sell their property to a person from the nations, uh, and they will continue farming and utilizing the land without giving it a rest. Then in the eighth year, they'll buy the land back and continue for the next six years. Uh, the problem with that is that in the past that God has driven the people out of the land. And if you recall with the Babylonians, they were there in Babylonia for 70 years. Because for 400 and some years, they had not given the land a rest. And so God told them, in your exile, the land will now have the rest that it was owed while you lived on the land and did not give it a rest. So uh, God has proven himself to be quite diligent uh, about what he requires uh, for those that would live in the land uh, of Israel. Now, are we looking at a problem in Israel? Well, possibly. I don't live there. I don't know what farmers do exactly. Uh, I've only heard what people say. So I would hope 
that there are some farmers that actually do what God says they're supposed to do. Um, otherwise, I don't know how long God is going to just not enforce the rules and the stipulations that he placed on his land. He hasn't changed. He has given them the land back. He has reestablished them as a nation. Um, he's doing his part. Now Israel needs to do their part. Now here in America, we're not underneath those kind of uh, regulations, um, which, you know, people say, well, okay, uh, should we do that or should we not? Well, we're not required to do it. But what we have found out from farmers that do give the land a rest, uh, we used to do rotating crops. And so we would let the land go fallow for a period of time. We didn't do it because of biblical standards, but we did it because we understood that the land needed to rejuvenate itself. Um, so even in America, we realize that the land needs a rest. We just have never, not that I know of anyway, nobody I knew ever followed it because of a biblical directive. But we did follow it because we understood uh, what goes on in the soil and how it does need to rejuvenate. So anyway, we know that there is a benefit for it. In Israel, there is more than just a benefit. There is an absolute blessing that comes when you're obedient to God and doing what he says there. Now, in America, I believe you could also experience the same blessing, uh, but it's not a requirement. In other words, it's one of those things like Rosh Hashanah. Uh, you can observe Rosh Hashanah or not. God says that he's going to be there, and there's a blessing for doing it. Uh, if you don't show up, well, uh, it's not required, so you haven't really broken any regulation. Uh, and I feel the same way about the soil issue. Uh, if you give it a rest, well, it's right for the earth. If you don't give it a rest, it's not necessarily applied to the whole earth. At least biblically, it's not described as such. Uh, I personally feel like uh, if you can give the land a rest, you should. Uh, but that's just, that's me. I don't have a chapter and verse that says that, yes, you must do this or do that. So as we move on, um, when you give the land a rest, uh, this is the problem in an agricultural society. Uh, Julie is growing a garden this year. Uh, she's been blessed. God has given her an abundance. Well, if that was what she was relying on to feed her family, well, then this year is very good, and God has blessed her. She could eat well uh, for a period of time. You've got to find a way to store up stuff and keep the garden going. But if it, she did that for six years, and then on the seventh year, she was not allowed to plant anything in her garden. Well, where does she get the food to eat for a whole year while there's nothing growing in the garden? Well, <laughs> these are the restrictions that God placed uh, on the, the growth that would be in the field that would grow up on its own. Now, there were first growth restrictions. In other words, no harvesting anything that was planted. And this is, and when I say this, we got to be careful. I got to be able to say it so we get it. Um, anything that produces a seed that falls off of the stock in, onto the ground and then grows is considered a first growth and that means it came up voluntarily you did not plant it but it planted itself anything that would grow from that new seed uh, was not to be harvested or used uh, in the seventh year so there was no harvesting fallen seeded crops they were all considered as being planted. 
we read here in verses 5 through 7, it says, Your harvest after growth you shall not reap, and your grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land shall have a sabbatical year. All of you shall face the Sabbath products, uh, shall have the Sabbath products of the land for food yourselves, and your male and female slaves, and your hired man, and your foreign residents, those who live as aliens with you. Even your cattle and the animals that are in your land shall have all its crops to eat. Now, that verse, that section, makes it complicated for us to understand because on one hand it says you're not to eat it, and then it, then it says right after that you can eat it. And so we have to understand uh, what is being said. And, of course, the Jewish community uh, in the Hebrew, there are words that do not translate well into English, and this is one of those places. Uh, what is being said is anything that would be seeded, like uh, uh, wheat or anything that produces a grain that would fall off, land on the ground, then it would rain and it would grow up. You were not to eat that stuff, okay? But if when you ran the scythe through your field and you harvested the grain, if indeed it grew another, uh, stalk from the same root you could eat that all right that means it was like uh you cut off celery for example that's an easy thing if you cut celery off uh it will regrow again matter of fact if you bring celery home you can cut the top of it off put it in a glass of water and it'll grow new celery well, anything that would grow that way from the same stalk was then eligible to be eaten. And that's B in our notes. Only second growth gleaned from first plant stalk was allowed to be eaten. And you could eat that. Uh, C, the other restriction was there was no pruning or field prep during Sabbath years of Jubilee. In other words, uh, what farmers like to do is they like to go out and turn the soil, you know, put all of the um, uh, stalks from the year before, uh, the residue, if you will, into the soil. So when it rains, it can decompose and it adds to the uh, nutrients within the soil so that the, the soil is ready to produce an abundant crop. Well, God says, no, you're not doing any of that on the Sabbath year. So we have these three things uh, you could eat. You could not eat first growth, uh, anything that seeded itself, but you could eat things that grew from a stalk as a second growth, if you will. And there was no pruning uh, or field prep during the seventh year. Now, number three in our notes, this was a law for everyone who lived as part of Israel in the land that Yahweh leased to Israel. Now, when you realize that, uh, then what the Jewish community does, if they sell the land to a foreigner, to a Gentile, uh, for a year, if that person lives among Israel, uh, God has got it covered, and they are guilty of misusing the land. Now, you know, I, when we talk about this from a Levitical standpoint, it makes it seem as though, okay, well, well this is, you know, uh, Israel is headed for big trouble. Uh, they may be. You know, God is a merciful God. Uh, my concern is that even though he's a merciful God, he does come to a place where he, whenever there's a major change coming, he raises the standard up to where it's supposed to be and lets people see that when he says you are not to defraud one another, that he really truly means it. Um, Ananias and Sapphira uh, tried to defraud and it cost them their lives. 
uh, is God uh, in our transition period and in Israel's transition period? Is God going to once again raise the standard to the level that he has declared that we are to be holy as he is holy? We are to be perfect as he is perfect? Or is he going to continue to let us uh, get by with things? Now, remember, not too long ago, uh, we were teaching and talking about, anyway, the fact that if God loves you, he will discipline you. Uh, if he doesn't discipline you, then you need to really question, uh, where am I on God's scale? I mean, if he's letting me get away with things that I know he's very clearly defined uh, in the Torah, in the Tanakh, then how come I'm getting away with it? Uh, well, maybe you need to address the issue of how close you are with the Lord and how well the Lord and how close he is uh, with you. Just a thought, you know, that's my thought. So, okay, number three. Uh, yeah, this was a law for everyone who lived as part of Israel in the land that Yahweh leads to Israel. Uh, a uh, total dependence on Yahweh. Uh, in the seventh year, the truth was that you were totally dependent upon Yahweh to provide for you. Now, when... Most of us have gardened in the past. When we harvest, we, we harvest our squash or whatever it is, and the plant can continue uh, to produce flowers. Uh, I mean, I planted a, uh, uh, a tomato uh, one time. It was a cherry tomato variety, and I just planted it out behind my, my cabinet shop. Uh, in, it was really in a, in a pile of debris. Uh, there was some dirt and rocks and cement and all kinds of stuff. And I just planted this plant out there. I thought, well, why not? If it survives, it'll survive. Well, that plant lasted for two years. I mean, we didn't water that thing. Only thing we ever did, we used to, everybody went out. It produced really, really sweet little tomatoes. And as we would eat lunch, all the guys from the shop would go out and gather up a bunch of them and eat the tomatoes. I mean, they were, they were sweet. Uh, and that plant just didn't die. I mean, it just it was a survivor. Uh, so, I mean, on one hand, um, God could do that as well in Israel. Uh, he could grow crops from the stalks and make sure that you had enough, but you were, in essence, totally dependent upon him to provide you with the food from the field. Now, if you had money, uh, we must realize uh, that at this time, uh, when Israel was still in the wilderness, and even when they got into the land, there would be trainers that would be going through. If you got three million or plus people, there's always going to be people showing up wanting to sell you something. It's not like, you know, you're, you're out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, like living in Indio and they're not going to build, <laughs> they're not going to build any stores out there because it's out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, every store is going to show up and try to be, sell to people in Indio stuff. And, you know, so it was the same way. You have to think that if you got 3 million people, you're going to have people coming with merchandise to sell. They will bring produce in. They will haul it from wherever. Uh, there was all kinds of stuff going on. We, we, we have a tendency, I think, and I, I know maybe it's just me, but I used to think all the time, well, Israel's out in the middle of the desert. I mean, there's nothing around. It's just them and God and nobody. Well, that's not exactly the way it works. Uh, if you get three million people anywhere, people are going to know there's three million people out there. <laughs> and somebody is going to be enterprising enough to go, hey, you know what? 
I bet I could sell them some stuff and they'll show up and sure enough, you got commerce going on. So let me run, uh, run my notes up a little bit so you guys can see more of them. There we go. Uh, we had total dependence on Yahweh. You've got to remember, I mean, he provided for them for 40 years uh, with manna. Well, if he can provide them with manna, he can certainly provide them with stuff that will grow once they cross over the Jordan uh, that will grow naturally and supernaturally in their gardens and on their farm. So. Okay, uh, number four, Jubilee consisted of seven land Sabbaths. Now, this is how you figure the Jubilee. If you started out with year one, and then you had six years of labor, then you had a land Sabbath. Well, you repeated that seven times, and seven times seven is 49 years. Uh, and then you add a Jubilee, a 50th Jubilee year. Now, that that seventh seven had one year added to it, which makes it uh, an eighth year. Whenever we have within the scripture, I don't care where you look, you have a series of seven. Whenever there is an extra added year or week or day onto something, it always transforms it into a eighth day or eighth week, whatever it happens to be, and it indicates it's a new beginning. Uh, even in the temple, when the temple was constructed, there were seven steps that led uh, from the outer court up to uh, the inner court. Then from the inner court into the holy, into the, into the sanctuary, there were eight steps. It was a new beginning. Uh, indication reminding Israel that whenever there is a number eight, it indicates a new beginning of some sort. So when you come to the Jubilee, it indicates that the Jubilee is a new beginning period. Uh, we're right now, we're in the fifth of the four uh, series of Jubilees. This is the fifth one. We're three years into the fifth 50th year jubilee time frame now you know we got 47 years to go and most of you have heard my perspective i think that uh this testing period we're in if we test out right uh we could have a tremendous <laughs> blessing ahead of us if we test out wrong, we could have a period of time ahead of us that is not going to be such a blessing. It doesn't mean it's going to be just one mess after another, although it could. Um, I'm not God. He, he meets out his discipline and his blessing according to his standard and his purpose. He doesn't inquire of me. And uh, so... You know, I'm just like everybody else. Uh, I have great hindsight. Oh, yeah, look what happened. Uh, foresight, well, I just have to trust in the fact that God said we are to be prepared. And so my objective right now is to get prepared, to be prepared, and hopefully uh, help everyone else be prepared for whatever might come. There are lots of Lots of things that are, have great potential for good and for bad. Amen. Was that, was that Dorothy? Yes. <laughs> Dorothy. That's what I'm doing, getting prepared, baby. <laughs> you better mute yourself, Dorothy, if you're going to have uh... a... <laughs> You're liable to wake up the other folks here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, if we can uh, keep your laughing down to just a small giggle. <laughs> 
All right. So um, when you have a 49th year, uh, uh, a land Sabbath, that's the 50th year. Uh, the 50th year is also a land Sabbath. Uh, and what you end up with is that um, you have two years in a row in which the land has a Sabbath and there is no planting, no harvesting, uh, all the restrictions apply. Now, in the first year of the new Jubilee period, you can plant, but you got to remember, just because you plant doesn't mean everything comes up the next day. So, you know, you got to, it, uh, it depends on what you plant. You know, if you can't hardly wait to eat a radish, you know, a radish will grow in, in 35, 40 days or less. Uh, but other plants take up to 80 days. Uh, some take up to several months. Uh, and so you got to realize that in the first year, even though you could plant and harvest, uh, if you waited until the time, uh, and by the way, the time had to be uh, the Jubilee year started biblically on Yom Kippur at the close of Yom Kippur. It was announced as the Jubilee year. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But so you had two years and a partial year in which you really had to depend on God for your food. Now, or, you know, the merchants, if you had money, you could buy from them. But as far as fresh stuff and producing a crop, and by the way, uh, you must remember that in Israel, uh, they actually were agricultural. And that meant that they grew things and sold things. That's also how they earned a living. And so it meant that you weren't really earning a living during the years that the land was having its rest either. So, you know, it was, it was a major, major thing to have to trust God completely. And um, yeah, that's part of the reason, I guess, why Israel didn't really keep the Jubilee uh, as we think maybe they should have. But I would ask you, as I've asked myself, okay, Paul, so let's say the land gets a rest and you're not going to harvest, you're not going to plant for two years, you're going to trust God. Uh, how do you think we might do on all that? You know, it, <laughs> it could be a challenge, you know. Uh, I mean, most of us are not farmers. We're not substance farmers. So it's really hard for us to project. But nonetheless, even with the limited knowledge we have, I think we could all agree uh, it might take a little more uh, confidence in God's provision than what we're used to. Uh, that's the thing I'm concerned about in the future, our immediate future here in America. I mean, I do go to the grocery store and I pay attention to what's on the shelves and what's not on the shelves. And I've watched things disappear from the shelves uh, that used to be uh, things that were there. Uh, but now the shelves are still filled up, but they're instead of beans and, you know, rice and kind of things that are staples, uh, we have Pop Tarts and you know, snack foods and stuff like that, that kind of filling the shelves because with people staying home, the tendency is that people sit around, watch TV and snack. Well, uh, that's all right for a season, but it's not good for you health wise. You need to be eating much better protein. Uh, at least I think protein, you can, my my son would say, "No, Dad, you need to eat vegetables," and <laughs> and that that's fine. I can eat a lot of vegetables, but uh, every once in a while, uh, I have a tendency to want to eat something other than vegetables. Anyhow, okay. So, um, where was I here? Get back up here to where I'm supposed to be. 
the 49th year, land seven. He had two years without a harvest. Now, number five in our notes is debt settlement price was based on projected crop values per year. Um, I lose my place when I look away. Uh, between sale and next year's uh, planting. Oh, and next Jubilee, sorry. Okay, let me get this right. That settlement price was based on projected crop values per year between the time of the sale and the next Jubilee. In other words, if you had 35 years until the next Jubilee, then if your crop value was $100, make it easy, and you owed $3,500, then for 35 years, the land would belong to the person you owed the money to. If you're able to pay it off sooner, then you could redeem the property. If not, it would revert to you after the 35th year. So uh, B in our notes, the spiritual connections and patterns. Number one, the Jubilee starts on Yom Kippur at the sound of the shofar, not at Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah. Uh, verse nine here, we read it here. It says, you shall then sound a ram's horn Abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, you shall sound a horn throughout the land. Ten, you shall thus consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim a release through the land to all the inhabitants. It shall be jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property and each of you shall return to his family. So, uh, now this is a very interesting thing. Uh, the Jubilee starts on Yom Kippur at the sound of the shofar. Now, if you remember about Yom Kippur, uh, we talk about sounding the shofar as the closing of the gates. In other words, on Yom Kippur, the gates, we say, because we listen to the Jewish tradition, we say that the gates are closed, that your fate is sealed for the coming year. Well, that's not exactly biblical, but that is the traditional teaching. And here's the biblical teaching as far as the sounding of the shofar. See, if the Jewish community does not keep the Jubilee, they have to come with an, up with an alternate reason for blowing the shofar on Yom Kippur. And so uh, we find that, you know, they say, well, the gates are closed. See, they look at Yom Kippur as a time of judgment. And since they cannot fulfill their obligations physically because there is no temple, then they establish certain days and change the meaning of those days to accommodate for what they cannot physically do. Uh, they were to make offerings before God that God would then uh, forgive all of their unintentional sin, that it would be completely eliminated from the community. Uh, they were to make offerings all year long, not wait until Yom Kippur to come before God and say, oh, God, you know, and, and recite 200 statements of, okay, well, I've done this sin, this sin, this sin, this sin, this sin, and so on and so forth, which is what we do because we follow that tradition. We make this pronouncement of saying, forgive us of this, 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 and this. And, you know, we're falling into the concept that, oh, well, there is no forgiveness all year until you get to Yom Kippur, you ask God's forgiveness, and you fast on that day, and God will then forgive you of all your sin, 
and seal you for the coming year. And we sound the shofar as an indication. Okay, good. We're good. We're good for the year. Now let's go ahead and enjoy the, the year. Well, that's not exactly the way God set everything up to operate. And with Yeshua, uh, we know because we've studied Leviticus that he has provided for unintentional sin. And Yom Kippur was very specifically a, a time of cleansing the whole community of unintentional sin. For those that did not understand, we were to pray for them. For those that were too naive, uh, we were to provide for them. And so here on Yom Kippur, we have again the offerings. We have the two goats that were brought, one for the Lord, uh, one for Azazel. Uh, and the sins were laid upon the hands of the goat that was sent out into the wilderness. And that goat was to carry those sins away. Well, that was symbolic of exactly what we do with Yeshua. Yeshua has, uh, we have the privilege of confessing our sin. And he has forgiven us of our uh, unintentional sin. And as far as our intentional sin, uh, that will all be paid for. Uh, when we die, and it all is laid at the feet of Satan, because Satan is the one who brought, if you will, uh, sin uh, into the world, and so basically it's symbolically saying he brought it into the world, he's going to suffer the fate for all of it. But the sounding of the shofar here is. This is the sounding of the shofar saying, okay, everybody is released. This is the 50th year. We sound the shofar, everybody's released, the jubilee begins. Now, it doesn't mean we sound it every year, we sound it on the 50th year, uh, which would have been for us the 2017. Now, more than likely, we'll still sound the shofar this year, uh, and symbolically, that's all right. We can listen to it and understand that it is actually talking about the time of the Jubilee. The Jubilee started, um, and we're processing and going through that whole procedure. So uh, the other aspect uh, of sounding the shofar is, a, a in our notes, is Jubilee. The Hebrew is Yobel, and it indicates a ram's horn. It commemorates God's ascension back to heaven. Psalms 47.5 reads that God has ascended with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is a king of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nation. God sits on his holy throne. So uh, the sounding of the shofar, uh, that the Lord ascends with a shout, and with the sound of the shofar or the trumpet, uh, we have the concept that God has ascended back to the heavenly realm. Now, what I want to share with you is right now, during this 40 days of repentance, the month of El Ul is understood that God is in the field. In other words, God is here amongst men, and he's here on purpose so that we can spend this time before him when he's not in his court, but when he is here. And we can approach him with our questions. We can approach him uh, when he's not in his quote-unquote official capacity of judging the world. Uh, see, when he's in the court, there are court procedures that must be followed. But when he's in the field, then we have access to God, if you will, 
that is different than when the court is in session. And so this whole concept, the time frame, uh, really is one in which we need to recognize that in our walk that God has, through Yeshua, provided us with the Holy Spirit, and we have connection with him that we would not, and people before us did not have, that we have access to God that is unprecedented. And because of that, that that's a great blessing, but it is also something we have to be very uh, cautious about. Because to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, God giving us access uh, to him through the Holy Spirit, uh, through the Ruach, uh, means that you and I uh, have the privilege, of course, communicating with him, but we also have the obligation of listening to what he says and doing what he directs us to do. So, you know, when we look at that, we have to realize that, yes, uh, there's a two-edged sword to all of this stuff. And uh, so uh, hopefully we, we can see that and be forewarned, if you will. Okay, uh, B in our notes, creation, uh, the work week, the Jubilee, Shavuot, and Sukkot all share a common connection pattern. I mean, we work six days or six years. The seventh day or the seventh uh, year is a Sabbath. Uh, seven completed cycles of any seven you want to talk about. If you add a one more, either day or year, uh, it adds up and it's a new beginning. And new beginnings, you know, we talk about when we celebrate Sukkot, we have the eighth day. Well, the eighth day is the day of, of new beginnings. It's we've completed our obligations before the Lord. We spent our time with the Lord. Uh, we've done the, the water pouring ceremony, all of that. And now it's, it's, this is now the eighth day. And on the eighth day, is it's the time for us, of course, uh, to prepare to return to our homes, but to return to our homes with a new infusion of a relationship with God that's been built on spending seven days in his presence, seeking his face, you know, being before him, uh, rejoicing. Now, uh, I'll say this. Um, Sukkot is the season of our rejoicing, uh, but we must remember it is, it is a prerequisite or a pattern for a future day. Um, we have not won the victory yet. Let me just say it that way. Um, sometimes you watch uh, sporting events and I don't watch them, but people do. And so we've all seen it. Uh, you're in the final moments of the game, and one team is ahead. And the other team, you know, is they're running out of time. They're down to just a minute or something or 30 seconds. And one team, you know, people are on that side. They're rejoicing. Yeah, we, we won. You know, we're, we're the champions or whatever. But at the last split second of time, the other team then does something that scores a goal or makes a point, and the, the team that was all jumping up and down rejoicing of, yeah, we're, we're winning, yeah, we won, all of a sudden it's like the whole table has turned. And they realize, what, we lost? We lost? Well, that's because they started rejoicing before the reality had really been accomplished. Um, you know, um, where we're at right now, if I were to say it, uh, we're in a war. 
And, you know, um, Hanukkah is as it is today because Israel was in a war and they were unable to celebrate Sukkot. And so instead of celebrating Sukkot, they completed the war. And uh, they rededicated the temple, and they did it during Hanukkah. And the reason we have an eight-day celebration of Hanukkah is because it's actually a late celebration of Sukkot with the eighth day being a time of new beginnings. Well, everybody knows that, but we, we forget about it because we think, well, they were in a war. Well, we're in a spiritual war. Only we just don't see it. And so we're, we're all about, well, let's do Sukkot and rejoice. Uh, I'm a little concerned about that. I, I think we need to be very much on guard. Uh, this is... And not that we shouldn't celebrate Sukkot, I'm not saying that, but I think we should just really be very focused on the reality. I'd hate to see us rejoicing, ha-ha, on great, great day, great time, um, when we're actually uh, on the brink of one defeat or another. Anyway, that's, that's my perspective on it at this point doesn't mean that, um, you know, something horrendous is going to happen. I, I just, I'm one of those people that I drag to be prepared as, as opposed to surprise. Uh, let me just say it that way. So, now Israel's obedience um, to, this is number two in our notes uh, under B. Israel's obedience to least stipulations results in abundant harvest and security. Uh, that's verse 18 in our notes. Um, my fan keeps blowing my pages shut, so I have to fiddle around to find it. But anyway, verse 18, it says, You shall thus observe my statutes and keep my judgments so as to carry them out that you may live securely on the land. Then the land will yield its produce so that you can eat your fill and live securely on it. Well, okay. Uh, verse 18 is basically giving us uh, God's indication as to what is supposed to transpire. Now, Israel's obedience is what will make the difference, whether they have abundant harvest and security or not now right now with the land of israel they have all kinds of abundance when it comes to producing uh, and the land actually bringing forth fruit and vegetables and produce and so forth um, but as far as security goes security is another issue that they they spend the majority of their gross national product providing for their security. And so, you know, it's one of those things of uh, their obedience may have a factor in that. Uh, now, A in our notes, nature must submit to God's commands. Now, that's an interesting thing for us to consider. Uh, when God says, when the, my people are in the land, the land is going to produce abundantly. and it's a proven fact. Uh, when Israel is in the land, the land produces. When others are in the land, the land then does not produce and returns to being fallow. Uh, a living proof of that is Gaza. Gaza, when it was under the control of the Israelis, it produced 80% of all the kosher food in Israel. Now that it's underneath the Palestinians, it doesn't produce enough food to even feed the Palestinians by far. Um, God's land is subject to God's directive. Now, when we, when we read in the Brit Hadashah, we find that 
one of the verses that's very prevalent there that says that the whole earth is waiting in anticipation for the revealing of the sons of God. That falls right in line with the very same concept we're speaking of here. God knows that the land uh, is a land that can produce. It is a blessed land when God's people are in the land. Uh, those of us that have joined ourselves to Israel, and by the way, Julie, I would say that uh, your produce this year um, has a great deal to do with the fact that you've joined yourself to Israel, and you've put your hands to the soil, and you've brought a blessing to soil that everybody else says nothing will grow there, uh, nothing has grown there. And you really are wasting your time. Well, the difference is that you're a daughter of Zion. You've been grafted in. You become part of Israel. And to me, you fall underneath the blessing that is given to God's children. And because of that, the land is producing for you like it never has for anybody else. And, uh, you know, I just, I look at those little things like that and I think, man, Lord, you're proving yourself to be true to your word, even in a little hundred by hundred lot, you know, <laughs> in Redland somewhere that was full of weeds and who knows what else. Uh, but, you know, God is a God who is true to his word. And so if we can learn anything, I mean, Julie's a good example for us and, um, uh, you know, a good example of God's faithfulness to what he says he'll do. So thank you, Julie, for pressing on in spite of what the neighbors might have said or anybody else might have said. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a great story. I love that. Okay. So uh, nature must submit to God's command. Men choose to submit or not. That's our verse 20 here. It says, uh, But if you say, what are we going to eat on the seventh year, if we do not sow or gather in our crops, then I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year, that it will bring forth a crop for three years. When you, uh, when you are sowing the eighth year, you can still eat old things from the crop, eating the old until the ninth year, when its crop comes in. So God is, you know, he just flat out saying, listen, if you'll trust me and do what I say, uh, I'll not only bless you for the two years, I'll make it go all the way through the third year. And, uh, you know, God is faithful to his word. All right, number three in our notes here, don't confuse redemption with the Jubilee release. Release is by decree. God has said, this is what will happen. He has decreed it so, and so that is exactly uh, why release functions. Redemption, on the other hand, excuse me, is by payment of a price. Usually it's by a third party who has the means to make the payment. In other words, if you were an individual living in Israel, uh, once they occupied the land and somehow you ended up in debt, if you had a rich uncle, he could redeem you by paying the price, paying the debt, and you would be redeemed. Now, the thing about the rich uncle, if he did it, he derived no benefit from it. Uh, in other words, uh, <laughs> if he paid and you never paid him back, well, that was just, that was just the way it was. Um, and so that's part of the reason why Israel never was all that hot about the Jubilee concept. The, the thing is, though, I think that um, uh, all people, most of us anyway, we have to realize that being obedient to God is its own reward. You know, we have a tendency to want to be obedient to get. That's a natural earthly tendency. You know, I'll help you with the idea that, oh, well, then you can help me. Well, 
that's not exactly how God wants us to function. He wants us to function like him. He said, listen, you, you go and you treat your neighbor as yourself. And let me worry about what happens. All right? If your heart is right and your focus is right, I am your source. It's not your neighbor reciprocating and giving you back equal what you gave to them. It's God saying, listen, I am the one you are to look to. I am the one who will take care of you. You can trust me. Don't believe that if you lend a thousand dollars to this person that, oh, well, you know, somebody else is going to just come along and give me uh, uh, eleven hundred dollars, even more. I mean, it might happen. But if that is your focus, you might wait a very long time for that person to show up. Uh, we just have to realize to really walk with the Lord. We just have to give unto the Lord and let it be his business as to what he does for us one way or the other. Matter of fact, you know, um, if I give anything, I, <laughs> I do not even think about it after that. It's like I even forget because I don't want to remember because I don't want to be, you know, if walking by somebody and go, oh, yeah, well, I helped that guy, but, you know, he's never even done this or done that. Well, you know, that you might as well never do anything because you're only doing it for a reward. And that's the whole wrong attitude completely. You know, if you're going to do anything, do it as unto the Lord and say, Lord, <laughs> you know me. And I know you're taking care of me, and that's all that matters. And just go ahead and do it and move on and let the Lord be your blessing. And if he doesn't want to bless you here, you know what? For whatever reason, uh, you know, I look, I look beyond here. Uh, there's, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to take anything with me when I leave here. Uh, but there are rewards awaiting me when I get there. And if I get all of the blessing here, in other words, oh yeah, I get the little pat on my little pointed hat that, uh, you know, you did good, Paul. Well, in the Brit Hadashah, it says, you've received your reward. That's all there is. But, you know, for all of you guys to go, oh yeah, Pastor Paul, what a wonderful guy. I mean, it's nice of you to do that, but if that's the sum total of it, uh, I appreciate your appreciation, but really what I am looking forward to is the Lord's recognition. And when he says, come in my good and faithful servant. And you should be looking for that same thing as well. You know, uh, I don't want everything that's that's why the scripture says if you do something don't tell everybody you know if you if you give something to somebody you help somebody you don't have to tell everybody in the world uh just let it go if nobody finds out the only one that really matters to know is the lord and was it done with the right kind of heart you know is yeshua uh right now at the right hand of the father going Oh, yeah. Wait till they get up here. Boy, I mean, they're all going to be telling me what a great guy I was. You know, <laughs> we love the Lord because he first loved us. And he did it because he absolutely wanted to do what he did. He wanted to please the Father. He pleased the Father. Now, whether he pleased me or not, well... You know what? I, I'm sure that, you know, I want to be grateful, but I don't really think he's just sitting up there, you know, weighing in the balance of, okay, I got 45 million people that are grateful and 200 billion people that are not. Oh, man, it's not working out. I don't think God thinks that way. Anyway, don't let me get carried away with that stuff. We can move on from there.
All right, nature must submit to God's command. Man chooses to submit. Uh, redemption is by payment of a price, usually by a third party who has the means. Uh, moving into number or letter number C or letter C, uh, special circumstances for property redemption in God's land. Now, we're going through this stuff. There is a spiritual connection that's here, but if we don't understand the physical, talking about the spiritual uh, <laughs> takes us way beyond the foundation. So we do kind of have to. Uh, Take a look at the physical. A house inside a walled city only has a one year redemption time period. Uh, that's verse 29 uh, in our text. So, uh, the idea being that inside of a walled city, uh, it's not an agricultural area, it's more of a commerce area. And people that earn their living, if you will, from commerce. Uh, they're not relying upon the land to be their blessing. They're relying upon their ability to uh, conduct commercial enterprise. And so God deals with them somewhat differently. Now, in the spiritual realm, you could look at it and say, okay, um, so the earth belongs to God, and the earth, we're supposed to be taking care of the earth. Um, but if my focus is not on the earth and, you know, what God has created here, but it's on enterprise, my ability to conduct business, uh, then, okay, hmm, I've got a, I, God deals with me a little differently. And so, you know, we begin to look at that and you, you can explore that and think it through. Uh, you know, as I, I look at these things, I go, all right, there's something here. I'm not saying that I have it that I thought it all the way through and I know exactly what it's about. I'm not saying that. I just, I throw up every once in a while, just a concept. Uh, you can choose to explore it or say, I think you're nuts. It's okay. If you think I'm nuts, I, it really is uh, not going to uh, knock me off my little high platform. I'm on here. I'm already been knocked off a few times. So, uh, anyway, so a house inside a walled city only has a one-year redemption period. A house in an unwalled town is treated more like a farm uh, with full jubilee rights. And the reason for that is, is if you, have, you live in a village without a wall around it, it's not a commercial center. Uh, it may be a village, but there is still land adjacent to it and you're still in touch with the land, uh, a little bit like Julia. Uh, you know, she's out farming in the, in the lot next door or whatever. So uh, she still has that connection. So anyway, um, and then uh, number three, all Levitical properties have full redemption rights no matter what the circumstances. In other words, because the Levites God had set them apart as his specific servant. Um, that no matter what was theirs was always redeemable. And so, you know, I'm just saying here, if you think this through, God is making a distinction between people that are all his. People that lived in walled cities, people that lived in villages, and the Levites. Uh, and it's, you know, some people say, well, God is not a respecter of person. Well, he's not a respecter of person in regards to those that are willing to submit to him and do what he wants done. But he certainly does look at us individually, and he does utilize us all differently. And that's perfectly all right. It's not, it's not like, you know, because I'm a pastor that I get special privileges as far as being able to be disobedient to God and getting away with it. Uh, it's just the opposite, actually. And uh, so, you know, it, it's okay that God deals with this differently. He's not a respecter of persons. In other words, he's not going to reject you because you're not a pastor uh, or any of that kind of stuff. So hopefully we can see that and not trip over that too much. So. Uh, 
Now, D in our notes, indentured servants, bond servants, human property are all under Yahweh's regulation. Now, you know, when we talk about these, these categories of people, um, A in our notes, indentured servants are not um, slaves but they are bound exclusively to the debtor that they owe. Um, now, God provided for Israel to own human property. And I'll say this, we could try to defend the whole concept uh, of slavery by saying, well, that was what was going on in that time frame. Um, and so God dealt with people based on that level. And there is truth to that. That was very common at that time. And it, it still actually is still being practiced in the world today. Uh, you know, in America, we're, we're all about, you know, uh, what happened with the black community and so on and so forth. Uh, well, you know, I happen to be of the Irish community, and the problem for the Irish was that England uh, thought of the Irish as being the worst of the worst of humanity, and Irish slaves were cheaper than black slaves, so Irish slaves were actually treated worse. Uh, it was, being Irish, I'm a little sensitive to the sun. So working in the fields, picking cotton or cutting uh, cane sugar or whatever, uh, I will, Irish were not as able as the black community to work in that environment. So if you follow history, uh, you find out that England sold lots of Irish into the slave trade. Uh, matter of fact, that's why we have what they call uh, mulattoes. Uh, which are a mixture of black and white, usually with red hair. Where do you think they got the red hair from? Uh, the Irish were very much a part of the slave community. And so, you know, people that had slaves bred them like cattle to produce what would be usable in the most economical way. So, you know, when it talks about reprobations and all of that kind of stuff, you know, I look at it and I go, well, okay. Um, you know, 200 years after the fact, we want to pay people for something that they never experienced. I say, well, okay. If we're going to do it, then maybe I should raise my hand. I'm Irish. Uh, send me some money. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't believe in it, but nonetheless, that's, That's something that's being pushed around these days. So indentured servants are not slaves, but they are bound exclusively to their debtor, meaning that you lived on the person's property or uh, in their home. You ate what they fed you. You slept where they told you. You did what they, they required you to do. Um, God had very specific regulations. They were not to be abused. Uh, matter of fact, uh, if you actually had an indentured servant or a bond slave, if you will, uh, it was almost problematic because you had to treat them better than you had to treat your own children, if you will, in, in, in one regard. Um, you know, uh, if, you, <laughs> if you get your kids to work, it was better than to have to have an indentured servant. but. Nonetheless, uh, so then uh, number two on our notes, a bond servant is one who is voluntarily committed to serving a master after being redeemed. Let's say you're in a situation and uh, the household that you're in is a wealthy household and, you know, working for the master that you've been assigned to, like Nathan with David, for example, uh, Gehazi. Uh, with the prophet, you could commit yourself to staying with that person and being their personal assistant. 
um, you know, it, your life may end up being better than it was working out in the field and trying to make a living by being a farmer, uh, you know, and so bond slaves uh, were those who had voluntarily committed themselves to serving a master once they'd been redeemed and set free. And so A in our notes, bond servants are like an exclusive employee, like somebody's personal assistant. Uh, there, there are accolades that come with being somebody's personal assistant. It's uh, not always bad. Now you're not always abused. I mean, people can be, but uh, when you did it before the Lord, uh, that was not what was supposed to take, take place at all. Now, number three, human property slaves. Uh, Israel was restricted to only having foreigners. Uh, no Israeli slaves were allowed. Uh, because all Israelites belong to God. Now, we can relate that right over to where we're at today. There are all kinds of people that are enslaved to drugs, to alcohol, to this, to that, all kinds of things. Well, God says, my people are not to be enslaved. And so we have a right, if you will, and an obligation to set God's people free from whatever slavery, to redeem them, to pay the price necessary uh, to get them out of that kind of bondage, that kind of slavery. So, you know, we can go into this, and this is a subject we could we could bat around for quite a while. Uh, as long as slavery has been an issue in the world, people are still dealing with it as we are in our world today. So then we come uh, to the concept of the kinsman redeemer. Uh, the kinsmen, like we are responsible uh, if we see a brother or a sister who has fallen into sin or is into bondage, we're responsible to go to that person and to try to help that person to do what we possibly can uh, to redeem our countrymen. Uh, people that do not know the Lord. Now, this is, this is a different um, if we find and know people that are in bondage that do not know the Lord, our first obligation is to try to bring them to a knowledge of the Lord. And then once they become a grafted in, born a new person, if you will, then uh, we can deal with them and getting them free from the bondage they're in. The problem is we, we see people in bondage and we just want to set them free without going through the procedure that God said is necessary. Now, every foreigner that lived in Israel could have been joined to Israel by grafting in. They had to turn away from their idol worship. They had to turn to worshiping El Elyon, uh, God Almighty. Uh, you know, there were things they had to do, but and then if they were a foreigner, uh, they would no longer be a foreigner. They would be grafted in, and all of the blessings, uh, including the redemption, would be available to them to be set free. And so we need to understand that uh, God has really made provision, recognizing that slavery did exist, but also recognizing that people did not have to remain in slavery if they would choose to turn to him, because then all of the laws and regulations that Israel was bound by would be changed from dealing with a foreigner to dealing with a kinsman. And a kinsman had a whole different uh, level of uh, responsibility and blessing uh, attached to uh, who was and who was becoming. So Yeshua as kinsman redeemer, this is one in our notes, uh, redeemed Israel and those grafted into Israel's covenant. 
The, that's, that's why all of these things that we read about in, in the biblical text that we can say they apply to us is because we've been grafted in. We have joined ourselves to Israel, so God's covenants now apply to us. Those that have never done that have never come to faith in Yeshua. None of the Torah, rules, regulations, or anything truthfully apply to them. Now, they apply to them in the fact that of the society that they live in, that those regulations are beneficial for the development and the continuation of society uh, when we aren't all operating under anarchy. The anarchy that is going on in America today is because people want to eliminate God, they want to eliminate the police, they want to eliminate all rules and regulations and authority, they want to destroy the country, destroy the social fabric of the country. They just want to do what they want to do with no limitations or regulations to stand in their way. Well, that's anarchy. Um, you know, if, if you're going to have a society without uh, rules and regulations and enforcement capabilities, uh, your society will not prevail for very long. Uh, the Roman Empire was destroyed because of anarchy. Uh, the Greek Empire destroyed because of anarchy. They, they were very successful, both of those, until they decided, well, we're so successful, we'll make our own rules, live the way we want, embrace all of the things that God says are an abomination to them, and their society failed. Uh, and it was destroyed. In America, that's where we're at. We're sitting on the brink of the very same uh, future if we do not stand up and uh, return uh, to the level of authority and submission to God's direction that he has established. Okay, so uh, uh, Yeshua's declaration concerning himself and his connection, if you will. Uh, whew, let me just go to Romans 11, 13 through 24. This is, this is, um, this is Paul writing about this subject. He said, but I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. Now this is beginning in verse 13. Uh, for if their rejection is a reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. Now, this is speaking, uh, Paul is speaking to the Gentiles that are coming to faith, uh, reminding them, excuse me, that Israel is right now and has been, because they rejected Yeshua, put in a position that they have been set aside, if you will, and Gentiles have taken in the position uh, that belonged to Israel. But he's warning us, he said, you know, um, if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Verse 17 goes on and says, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in men among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Uh, do not be arrogant toward the branches, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. 
you will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Well, that's quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand only by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in again. For God is able to graft them in again. Uh, for if you were cut off from what is by natural a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree again? Well, okay. So the warning is that non-Jews must be grafted into Israel in order to be under the covenant that Yahweh made with Abraham for the redemption of Abraham's son. Uh, this is a spiritual process, uh, not a physical one. Circumcision is uh, the physical process, if you will, that identified every male as being part of Israel. Uh, but uh, its circumcision of the heart uh, is much more important than the physical sign. So when we look at the Jubilee and all the things associated with it, we also have to look at the fact that it's many things are physical, but what are the spiritual implications? Um, in regards to the physical sign of the cutting of the flesh, Romans 2.27 says, and he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the regulations, the law, will he not judge you who, though having the letter of the law in circumcision, are actually a transgressor of the law. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. We spoke of that earlier. You know, we really want to hear the praise of God, not just the praise of men. So A in our notes here, Yeshua's declaration concerning himself and his connection as the Jubilee Redeemer. In Luke 4, 18, now remember, Israel has not been practicing the Jubilee. And here comes Yeshua. In Luke 14, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Well, that's interesting. That's uh, actually a quote from Isaiah 61, uh, which says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Okay, you might have noticed that Luke 4.18 and Isaiah 61.1 are similar. But Yeshua specifically left off some things that when he is about to return will be in force. And in verse 2 of Isaiah 61, it says, And to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, he said that in both occasions. Well, the favorable year of the Lord is a statement of talking about the Jubilee year. That is the favorable year of the Lord, the Jubilee. Okay? 
But what Yeshua left off in his statement was what Isaiah proclaimed would be what would also coincide with that favorable year of the Lord. And that would be in the day of vengeance of our God. So the Jubilee has a connection to the day of vengeance of our God. Now, from my way of thinking, uh, 2017 was a jubilee. The next one will be 2067. Uh, either 2017 initiated the process that we have identified as the tribulation, or it did not. Uh, my viewpoint is that it did not. But we are in a test period. The test period will determine what the next 40 years are going to be. Uh, we still have many things the scripture prophesies about before the return of the Lord that need to be accomplished. Uh, so I think, personally, we're facing a 40-year war. Um, we'll see how that turns out. I, uh, I want to be prepared for it, so that's what I'm, I'm doing. But um, it's an interesting concept that the vengeance of our Lord is attached to the Jubilee. And right now, if we have a 40-year uh, time frame ahead of us of uh, spiritual warfare that's going to in, be more intense than any season before, we are to be like the sons of Issachar, recognizing the time in which we live and realizing what it is we're supposed to be doing. Um, and, you know, I, I can go into a lot of detail about that, but we primarily already have a, a general idea, but I think we're going to have to get much more specific and much more zealous, if you will, to absolutely push in and make these things happen. Now, number two in our notes here, uh, we got three biblical types of kinsmen redeemers that Yeshua has already and will yet fulfill. Now. We can talk about the redemption goel. Uh, that's what the kinsman redeemer uh, is identified as. And the redemption goel, it means that somebody has paid the price. Well, Yeshua has paid the price, if you will, for our freedom. Then we have the goel hadam. That's the blood avenger. And the blood avenger will avenge all of the blood that was shed upon the earth without being dealt with according to God's justice system. Now, we realize that when the Lord returns and leads into the battle of Armageddon, the scripture there describes the blood will run in the Kidron Valley up to the bridles of the horses. That is a whole lot of blood. But when you stop and consider all the blood that has been shed by those that have been aborted, those that have been murdered without the murderer being put to death and equalizing that, um, that amount of blood, when you start considering it, appears to compensate for that which has been shed without God's rules and regulations being enforced concerning murder. So, and then the third one is the marrying Goel. Uh, now, this is the interesting one because when we're talking about 
the goel, if you remember, that if a man died without having a son and his widow was left, well, his brother, his kinsman, was to go in and marry the widow and father sons unto his brother's name. Now, isn't it interesting that Yeshua is going to come back and take a bride? And I'll let you contemplate that for a while because when we talk about the things that Yeshua as a kinsman redeemer is going to do, he is not coming for the world. He is coming for those that have grafted into the covenants. He is a kinsman redeemer. Now, in the Breed Hadashah, do you know how many times he's identified as a kinsman redeemer? The answer is zero. He's never identified as a kinsman redeemer. He is identified as a redeemer. Now, does that play into the concept that he has provided for the sins of the whole world? Uh, to be honest, I'd have to say I think that it does. But he is also very specifically a kinsman redeemer for those of Israel and those grafted into Israel. Now, when we follow this through and we realize he's going to be the blood avenger, for every innocent that has been murdered and for uh, every murder that's gone unprosecuted, uh, if you will. And then he's going to marry a bride and bring forth children. This is a very, very interesting subject and one that we could spend probably as long as we've spent in the book of Leviticus studying. Uh, I think it's fascinating. I love to try to understand things, but I want to leave us just with this. Um, the principle of release from debt and slavery is at the core of the Jubilee. And we find the work of Messiah that is spoken of in the Torah and in the Tanakh as being the heart of what Yeshua is going to do and has already done. So, with him being our kinsman redeemer, or our redeemer, and the connection with the Jubilee, uh, I really see that in 47 years, <laughs> if that is not the time frame, uh, if not earlier, because remember, God has said things are going to get so bad that if God does not cut the time short, that no no person would survive it. So um, I look at it and go, okay, I can figure out, it looks like uh, 47 years from now, we will have the return of Messiah. But I also think and look and say it could be sooner. The question is how much sooner? If truly uh, the world repents, during this season of repentance that is called the return that we are supposed to be part of, uh, will God change what is ahead? Will he remove us? He can, but will he? I do not know. Uh, I believe that many people will go through tribulation. But, you know, uh, God deals with his own people differently, just like he deals with those that lived in walled cities, those that lived in villages, 
uh, those that lived in the farmland that were Levites. Uh, God has that option. And uh, who is going to be the bride? Well, I believe personally the bride is going to be those that are under the covenant of Israel, that actually keep the covenant of Israel, and walk in the way that God has prescribed. Now, there's all kinds of people that have come to faith in Yeshua that do not keep the covenant of Israel. And I personally think the bride is going to be taken from that group that does. It may even be taken only from the original family that keeps the Torah and has their faith in Yeshua. I really don't know which one it's going to be, but I'm fully confident that whatever God decides is the right one, that we can all rejoice in the fact that, you know what, if I'm just in the bridal party, uh, I mean, I'm invited to the wedding. I mean, it's like, whoo, okay. <laughs> I'm going to rejoice on that day, no matter what. So, uh, and I pray that you all will be right there with me. And if not with me, uh, then in, in the inner chamber, let's put it that way. Uh, the only one for you, the best. Uh, of what God has to offer. So anyway, that's chapter 25. Uh, 26 and 27, uh, we may do them together. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Don't quote me on it. But I'd like to, if I can, uh, finish up uh, our study through Leviticus uh, before September. Well, Maybe not before September, but early on in September. Let's put it that way, okay? Uh, we'll do the best we can. Uh, after we finish with our Leviticus study, uh, I would actually like to go on and do some other studies. I haven't cleared it with Pastor Bruce or the powers that be, but I have a, I have a good suspicion they'll probably allow it. And um, I'm actually thinking about... Um, going through Galatians. Uh, Galatians is uh, a book that's often quoted by the Christian community and used to prove that we no longer are necessary to keep any of God's Torah. You know, we're not under the law anymore. And, uh, you know, uh, for those of us that I uh, have come to understand some things about Leviticus and the Torah. Uh, there's a lot of things that we need to bring to the table when we talk with our Christian friends uh, about the Lord and why it is important to not throw the Torah out, but to understand how it is still vibrant, alive, and a necessity for us today. We're, we're not living in the wilderness. We're not living in Israel, per se. But God's regulations, when understood from the church standpoint of what Yeshua has done and what the Holy Spirit is now currently doing among us, is still vitally important. So hopefully we can do that and uh, that you'll all join us when we initiate that and get it going. I may take... I may take a couple of weeks and uh, maybe do a little study on uh, the Moedim that we're coming up to. You know, we always have a teaching on Shabbat usually about the Moedim, but we, we don't necessarily um, get very deep into uh, the spiritual significance. So we'll see. We'll just see how it goes. So. Uh, if anybody wants to unmute themselves, you're welcome to do so. Um, I've got to find a way to, if everybody's done with the notes, I'll close out the notes. Okay.